So great to be with you this morning. My name is Justice, and uh, we are in a series called Anxious for Nothing. Are you guys enjoying uh, the last few weeks of studying anxiety and what God says about our minds and our mental health? You guys learn anything over the last few weeks? Today, uh, at our 1130 service, as always, we have interpretation happening for our friends, uh, our Spanish-speaking friends. So if you hear my voice in Espanol, we are glad that you are here. I talked to somebody yesterday who gave their life to Jesus over one of those translation devices. How cool is that? Um, as well as our friends from the deaf community, we are so glad that you are in this service. So you can always bring your friends to 1130. Um, so the other day, I'm dr- Oh, one more person is in the house. I got it. I got it before I just get into this. Uh, my friend and one of my pastor friends from Shepherd of the Hills, Pastor Tim Winters is in the house. Come on, will you stand up real quick? I love this guy. You are a rabbi to us. You've been such a support all these years. We were just a baby church trying to be like you when we grow up, and thank you so much for all the support. You guys don't know this, but Shepherd has helped us financially a number of times just with gifts and supporting our church, and man, we just thank you for all the support and the encouragement. 1.76 million people in the valley. Come on, let's lead them all to Christ. Amen? So I was driving in the carpool lane the other day um, without, a, without a passenger in the front seat. <laughs> Just so I don't feel terrible. Has anybody else ever done that or am I the only sinner at Freedom Church this morning? Okay, me and six other people break the law sometimes. Okay. Uh, is it a moving violation? I don't know. I'm driving and uh, a motorcycle cop pulls up next to me. And listen, here's the deal. I used to have an electric car, so you can drive in the carpool lane when you have an electric car, and it's okay. And I also have kids, so maybe I was thinking that my kids were in the car, and I just forgot. I don't know. Maybe I'm not that rebellious. But I'm driving, (laughs) and this motorcycle cop pulls up next to me, and he just looks at me, and he just goes. (laughs) Like, takes off. (laughs) What is that feeling when you know you've done something wrong, right, and you know, like, and you're getting that look from somebody, what is that feeling called? Come on, let me know. What is that feeling called? Guilt. What else? Shame. shame. So is conviction. So is guilt, is shame, is conviction, are those unique emotions or are those all the same things? Because if you, if you, if you know what I'm talking about, that moment you either get caught or you realize or something happens and you're like, oh, I wish I hadn't done this, right? That moment happens. One of those three feelings could be it. It could be guilt, it could be shame, it could be conviction. But what I'd like to talk about today is how those are different feelings. Those are different senses. You know, preparing for this week, I've been reading a number of resources and books regarding, you know, uh, the science of shame. And in this actual book I read called The Science of Shame, this is what uh, the doctor says. He says, when experiencing the emotion of guilt... It is usually guilt relating to something that they have done or might do, a certain behavior identified as an infraction of their value system. The attendant feeling is usually anxiety, fear, or apprehension. If experienced, often these emotions can become part of their personality, but they are separate from the person's core self. Now, that's guilt. Guilt can be a regret or a feeling about what you have done, but here is shame. He says, in contrast, when people have a shame attack... They experience it in the core of their being, embarrassing embarrassing exposure or a painful realization of being seen, a true mortification, humiliating sense of helplessness and vulnerability. Guilt and shame, they feel a lot alike, kind of like what we talked in the first week about anxiety and depression, but they're really just twin sisters. They're they're similar in their cause, but uh, they're not really the same thing. Just when you're experiencing guilt, it's often about a behavior, but when you're experiencing shame, it's often about a a, a feeling of worth. Shame is about who you are. Guilt is about what you've done. Is that simple enough? When I'm driving in the carpool lane and I've screwed up and I know I shouldn't do this and I know I'm going to have to go before you and confess my sins so that I'm healed and cleansed before the Lord Almighty, when I go through that, I don't feel bad about who I am, right? I'm not just like, oh man, there I go again. I'm such a sinner. I'm so worthless. Like I, I, I'm just like my daddy always told me I was going to be. I don't go through all that. That would be shame. But at the same time, there's this moment where it's like, wait a minute, am I going to take this thought that I have and I'm going to analyze it as it comes through the stream of my consciousness? How am I going to respond to this feeling? Kind of like we talked about in week one with anxiety. Anxiety is an emotion. And when it hits you, you're kind of like, how am I going to respond to this? Am I going to let this bring me farther from God? Or am I going to let this draw me closer to God? One of the great illustrations of this is in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, you find the creation story in which uh, is is actually a poem in ancient Hebrew in which which we see 
uh, really a, a great alignment of how God created things and how he intends us to view our role in creation with him. And as you know that in the story, God creates the world in six days, right? He makes the moon, he makes the stars, he makes the dinosaurs, he makes the unicorns, he makes all that good stuff. And at the very end, he says, oh, this is good, oh, this is good, oh, this is good, oh, this is good. Then the last thing he makes is what? Mankind. He makes you and me. He makes mankind, and he says, this is what? Very good. Hey, will you turn to the person next to you and say, you look very good this morning. Come on. Careful, Tim. That's my wife. Calm down. Calm down. Turn to her. Thank you. Uh, tell him you look very good. Tell him you smell very good. Thanks for brushing your teeth before the 1130 a.m. service. Let him know. So... Everything is going good. It's going very good. It's a, if there's a garden atmosphere, there's a presence with God, there's a relationship with him, everything's kind of in motion. It's not perfect, but it's the way God intended it to be. And everything's in motion. The, see, the thing is, is there's this moment where Adam and Eve are about to step into disobedience, which is called sin. Whenever you don't do something that, whenever you do something you know you shouldn't do, that's called sin. Whenever you don't do something that you know you should do, that's called sin. Like, that's really, it's like another word for a mistake or a regret. When you step into something that's outside of the way God intended it to be, that's really what sin is. And there was this tree that they weren't supposed to jack with. Do you guys remember the story? Don't touch the tree. We got a lot of trees in this garden, y'all. We got a lot of fruit in this garden, y'all. We got a lot going on. Don't jack with this one tree. And yet, because they have free will, because you and I have free will, the beautiful thing is that we can choose God. Being able to choose God is amazing. It makes a relationship authentic. But you could also choose other things. Now, that's really a great way to look at sin. They step into sin. They choose sin. They think they know better than God. They think that, that, that maybe this, this tree has something to offer that God doesn't offer. I mean, really, the lie of the enemy here, the serpent is like, you don't have to believe God. He's withholding from you. I think that's a lie we all deal with. What do you think? Sometimes we think that we know better. We think God's holding out on us. But they step into this moment of disobedience, and they introduce evil and sin into the world. And look at what happens immediately after. It says, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed figs le fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Listen to this. On the other side of their disobedience, when evil, when sin enters their consciousness, it enters the atmosphere, when the fall of man happens... The first thing they realize is, I'm exposed. The first thing they realize is, like, I'm naked. I'm naked, and you're naked. And what do they do? They try to sew together fig leaves to make themselves clothes. And I don't care how cool that looked if you shop at Urban Outfitters, okay? Listen, fig, le fig leaves are so hot this season. Listen to me. It's embarrassing. They are, it's a poor attempt to try to cover themselves up, to try to cover themselves the ingredients for shame are really these two main things. Number one, running to the, health, the unhealthy expectation of others. This is what shame makes you do. It makes you run to the un... It makes you try to be somebody that you're not. You see something, you compare yourself to it, you feel that shame, why am I not like that? And then you try to change to be like that. Or the other one, rather than running to the unhealthy expectation of others, you run away from others. You try to hide you feel exposed, right? So you run away. We see Adam and Eve, they do both of these. The first thing is they just try to cover them up because they feel exposed. And then look at what happens where it says next. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God in the tree of... Listen, every time they have ever been in the presence of God, it's always been a good thing. So what happened? What happened? Every time God has ever come to the garden at the cool of the evening, they're about to go on their little afternoon walk. They love afternoon walks with God. They love it. They see God coming like, man, I want to hold hands with God. I want a piggyback ride with God. <laughs> Let's go. This time, though, God comes walking in. They're like, oh, man, I'm naked. I got these fig tree things on. You know what? I'm exposed. Let's hide. They hide from God. And God comes walking in this story through the garden, and he starts calling for them. And what does his voice sound like? What is his voice like when he calls to you? What's God's voice like when he calls to you? What's it like? Listen to what the text says. But how does this sound to your heart when God's calling you? The Lord God called, where are you? How does that sound to you? Do you hear your dad coming home from work because the last thing you heard from your mom was wait until your father gets home? <laughs> Do you hear dad? I grew up in Texas, man. My parents are from Texas, okay? We didn't even get spankings in Texas. We got whoopings. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
When I hear my dad, I, I, I'm thinking of the belt coming through the loops. <laughs> right? Is that what God sounds like to you, though? Is that what God sounds like to you? Is that what it is? Is, is, is God coming through the garden? Where are you? Like he's the giant from Jack and the Beanstalk or something like that? What, is that how God's voice sounds to you? Dude, no. That's not how God talks to you. Come on. If you think that's how God talks to you, you haven't met Jesus. It's not how God talks to you. That might be how the enemy talks to you. That might be how you talk to you. That might be how shame talks to you. That's not how God talks to you. God doesn't put things on you that push you away from him. That's not his heart. Come on, does that make sense to you? The God who loves you enough to give his son Jesus a death on the cross for you? Do you think he'd want to do things that push you away from him after you give him such a precious gift? It doesn't make sense. God's not going to put that stuff on you that pushes you away. Some of you think that the guilt trips that you get or that you're giving yourself are from God. Can I set you free? God doesn't give guilt trips. He gives grace trips. He says, hey, come to me, all right? Let's, let's deal with this together. Let's figure this out. That guilt trip, man, that's coming from you. That's coming from your history. That's coming from the bully of shame in your life. I don't know where it's coming from, but I can promise you it's not coming from God. God already gave his son Jesus for you. He's not angry at you. Can I get a witness? He comes at you and he's saying, where are you? Now, why is he saying, where are you? Is it because he doesn't know where they are? Or does God know where they are? Yes, God knows where they are. But what's he doing? He's actually inviting them. He's saying, I know you're out there hiding and I know you've covered yourself up, but where are you? He wants them to speak up. He wants to give them a second chance to come out of hiding and come to them. That's what the Lord would say, tell so many of you guys. I mean, so many people in this room, you feel, even coming to church today was hard for you. You feel like God is a motorcycle cop with aviator sunglasses on looking at you going, hmm. <laughs> That's why half my friends won't come to church with me, man, because they feel like they're not worthy to even get to church. What a tactic of the enemy to make you think you're not even worthy of God's presence because he knows when you're in the presence of God, what lives in the dark, come on, dies in the light. I got friends who won't come to church because they feel like they're going to catch fire the moment they step in the Freedom Center. <laughs> By the way, can you guys keep bringing your friends to church every week? Over 200 people have given their life to Jesus over the last six weeks. <laughs> keep doing that. It inspires me. It makes me not want to give up on inviting my friends to church. It says, where are you? Where are you? You know? Come on. Where are you? And in that moment, they finally, maybe it was a tone of his voice in this the Lord God called, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were naked? Remember I talked about shame, how it being the unhealthy expectation of others. God's like, hey, when did being naked start, start being a bad thing? That's the way I created you. Who told you you need to cover yourself up like that? Who told you you need to wear those fig leaves? What happened here? Expectations have changed. Because sin has entered the equation. And now you have to respond. You can't ignore it anymore. Who told you that you were naked? Where'd you learn that from? Have you eaten from the tree in which I commanded you that you should not eat? Did God know that they ate from the tree? Yes, of course. What's he doing there? He's trying to get him to fess up. He's trying to get him to come to him. He's not coming at him trying to say, not with a big pointing finger, not giving him the stank face, okay? He's just coming at him. He's like, where are you? Hey, who told you being naked was wrong? How did that happen? Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Beckoning, trying to get a relationship out of them. Man, I hope that some of you today, the Holy Spirit sets you free of this fake, false voice in your mind that is not God, but it's the lie of the enemy. The enemy doesn't even have to lie to you anymore. Once the enemy has taught you to lie to yourself, he can move on to the next person. Some of you guys just think that you've been hearing the same lies your whole life, and that has become your imaginary friend. And I believe that that needs to be destroyed today. Anybody else believe we need to cast down the lie of the enemy today? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, I love this verse. It's holding us together through this whole series. I'll read it to you again. We demolish, say demolish, demolish. arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought that makes it, and make it obedient to Christ. We demolish it. In other words, we don't just ignore that voice, right? That's the temptation. I'm not going to listen to that voice anymore. No, no, no. Take the voice, take the lie, hold it up against the truth of Jesus and see who wins. Take it captive, 
hold it up against the truth of Jesus and see who wins. You don't need the lie and the truth cohabitating. You need the truth to set you free. Jesus doesn't say he likes truth. Jesus doesn't say he's all about truth. Jesus didn't say he just talks truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. He says, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the light. It's time for some of us to stop believing this stuff and to believe the presence of God is available in our minds, in our sanctuary, right here. This is the only thing that's getting in here is what you let in here. The enemy can't read your thoughts, okay? But once that lie is in there, all of us deal with these lies. I've dealt with shame before. I've dealt with shame. I remember when I was going to start this church, I had lived in LA for seven years. And all of a sudden, the Lord made it very clear to me that we were supposed to start a church in the valley. And I remember where I was on the 118 freeway. I was on the 118 and the 405, and I was on that little loop, and I was just right there. And the Lord was like, and I was like, Lord, when, where, where's, this church gonna, where's this church gonna start? And I was thinking about the Bible studies that we had going on here in the valley at different people's houses. And the Lord's like, well, duh, it's gonna be in the valley. And I almost jerked that steering wheel right off of that thing. I almost just, I was like, God, not the valley, please. <laughs> I love the valley, but man, I mean, I haven't lived there in seven years. I ran away from the valley, man. I, have, I don't need to get into it, but I have a history with some academic establishments in which they did not want me to return, okay? I have a history, okay? I remember getting, there was a private school here in the valley, and I, 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 was, I, was, I was not allowed to return, and then I was expelled my senior year. Fine, I said it. Okay, look, I was expelled. I went back. I got my degree, but you know the shame that I felt being expelled from school? Here I am, and I, I, I know I drove, I drove my, my teachers crazy. I know I'd done a lot of crazy stuff. Like, I get an invitation, I'm not kidding you, the first year I start the church, me and Maria started this church in 2011, I get that of invitation from somebody who was not a teacher there anymore, or who was not a teacher there when I was a teacher there. And he said, hey, I know you pastor our church in the valley, will you come lead uh, our, our, our service for our spiritual life chapel week that we're doing? I'm like, you want me to come preach at the school in which I was expelled? <laughs> I'm like, do I even return this email? The thing about shame is you have to address it. If you just let it go, you're, you're welcoming fear in your life. The scripture says in 1 Timothy 4, 7 that you've not been skipped, given a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. The Greek word for sound mind also means self-discipline, meaning it takes a discipline to take the thought captive and submit it to Christ and let Christ win. And I thought to myself, am I just going to just ignore this or not? And so I went to the school. I'm not making this up. This is such an embarrassing story. I rebuke you, shame, in Jesus' name. I went to the school, and first thing I did is I went to the track and field after school, and I saw some teachers walking around, and I went to each one of them, and I said, hi, I don't know if you remember me. They're like, um, I know I did this and this and this. I just wanted to ask for your forgiveness. And then I went over to the wood shop. Talked to, talk to my wood shop teacher. I literally accidentally cut someone with a woodshop tool one time. Like that's how not with nonsense that went on in that woodshop. And I had to say, hey, I'm so sorry for, you know, all that stuff. And he forgave me. And then I went to the boys counselor. <laughs> I literally got down on my knees at his, at his office and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I know I made your, I know I made your career just suck. <laughs> and he forgives me. And then I forgave me. And then I preached the Spiritual Life Week Chapel. And uh, kids gave their life to Jesus. And it was a story of redemption because I didn't let the shame continue in my life. I want you to have that story. God wants you to have that story. You see people and you look the other way, you know? You unfriend them on Facebook or you block them or you have a coworker and you, you know, you get that knot in your stomach when you pull into the parking lot. Whatever it is, those relationships or the, or, or the things in your life that, that, that are a, a bully of shame, shame trying to tell you that you are you know, not worth it or that you're always going to struggle or that that's who you are. You need to know the truth and his name is Jesus, that you are only who he says you are and everything else is a lie. He created you. He set your life into motion. You are not who, everything that you're doing. That is a mask. You are who he created you to be. He wants to remove the mask. He wants to remove that layer and he wants to set you free so that you can really live out who he's called you to be. In this creation story, we see that, that, that God has every intention for a great future for them. But then he, they, they've disqualified themselves. There's repercussions for their sin, and so they're on their way out. But that doesn't change God's heart for them, and he continues to serve them. You know, I want to talk for a second about the brain, the science of shame. 
Because what shame does is it messes with actually, it messes with your brain. And that's why this is so dangerous because you have a very, very, very powerful brain. You have a very powerful brain. In fact, in Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, it says it's the renewing of our mind that helps us know the will of God. It says we'll be transformed by our mind. Interesting that it doesn't say we'll be transformed by our heart. It says we'll be transformed by our mind. In your mind, you have this thing called um, amygdala, okay? There's these uh, almond-shaped clusters. I almost said Abdullah Oblongata. Do you guys remember? You guys remember Waterboy? Do you remember that? Abdullah Oblongata. Well, mama's wrong again. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> amygdala in your brain, and which your amygdala, they're basically a response system. It's like an alarm system for your brain, okay? So when something happens to you, your amygdala is activated. Like you step off a curb and a car is coming, okay? You don't immediately analyze like, oh, that's a Ford F-150. Oh, it's way bigger than I am. It's going 157 miles an hour. I, I'm only 180 pounds. Like you don't analyze all that. What, you, what do you do? You immediately just see it and you just jump back, right? Because God's giving you this brilliant brain and this brilliant response system. Alarm goes off, you respond. Someone throws something at you and you're not ready for it, what do you do? You shrink. You just have a response to it. But just like any alarm system, you got sensors in your brain, okay? And you have, those sensors have been activating and responding for different things throughout your life. Just like you have sensors on your alarm at your house. And if your sensors aren't dialed in, if it's too sensitive or if it's dialed in wrong, what happens? Every wind Every time it gets windy, the alarm goes off. And that's what sometimes your anxiety can be like, is that it's just, a, it's just a, an alarm system that just goes off too easily. You see a mole on your arm, and you go, does that have a dark center in it? I think I have cancer. And you freak out. You laugh like I'm joking, but, but, but hypochondria, this stuff's real, man. You look at it, and you're like, oh, man, I got to go to the doctor, I got to go to the doctor. Some of you guys go to the doctor way too much, okay? Some of you take your kids to the doctor way too much, Okay? Some of it's just overreacting immediately. Your sensors are going off, you know? Now, it's a gift to have that, but it can be a curse, right? It can, be, it can draw you away from God and draw you toward fear. Same thing happens with shame. Can I talk for a second about our social media behaviors and lifestyle for a second? I got to be careful about this because I don't want this to come off as a prescription. I don't want you to tell, I don't want to tell you to do what I do. Some, you know, that, I'm, not, I'm not teaching from the, I'm not, I'm not going to give you like what the Bible says about Facebook and Instagram, okay? But I will say this, that your brain has a reward center, and that when that reward center is activated, which you can activate yourself with instant gratification, dopamine is released, and you can trigger that yourself. You know the things that you can run to that make yourself feel better. In fact, the government knows the things that you can run to that make yourself feel better, and that's why there's regulations on them. There's an age restriction on alcohol because it releases, you know, makes you feel better. You run to it, dopamine release. There's an age restriction on smoking. There's an age restriction on gambling, okay? And these are things that may not all be bad things, but there comes a point where you're old enough where you have to actually regulate and moderate these things yourself. It takes a maturity to moderate those things I was sitting on a, on a flight the other day with this guy. Oh, I gotta tell you this story, it's a funny story. I'm sitting on a flight with this guy and he starts sharing his, sharing, he, I find out he's a scientist and he's, he's telling me about, uh, you know, science or whatever and I'm pretending like I'm not a Christian the whole time. I'm sorry, I was super bored. I was asking him all these questions about faith. <laughs> this is so funny. And I'm watching this guy like <laughs> to start to share his faith with me. <laughs> I'm about to give my life to Jesus <laughs> at this, and this. And uh, finally I asked him, I, I, I said, I said, with, with science, is it true that that frontal cerebral cortex, that it's not until you're like 21 years old that it's fully developed? He's like, yeah, it's true. Meaning parents, some of your kids are knuckleheads, okay? Just wait till the cerebral cortex, okay? It's, there's a reason why you can't drink till you're 21, okay? Because it's just, you're under development. You're not thinking as clear. You're not making the wisest of decisions. We got age restrictions on all these things where you can trigger your own dopamine release, but we don't got age restrictions on social media likes and comments. We don't, and that's what happens, man. You start finding the attention that you're getting on social media as a way to make yourself feel better. Can I pastor you for a second? That is a trap, man. It is a trap. It's not good for you. In moderation, it's great. But man, you know what I'm talking about. When you're not feeling good about yourself and you start checking in over and over again, how many likes, how many comments, whatever. Some of you, honestly, you need to consider turning off the notifications on your phone. 
Like I said, I don't want to be make this prescriptive, but I can tell you what I do. I don't have notifications on my phone. I've never had notifications on my phone. I don't want to be a slave to that thing. I do not want to pick it up and look at that and what did they say? What are they not saying? Who's not liking? Da, 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 da. I don't want to do that. And I know, just like you, that a lot of that attention can make me feel better, and I don't want to be slave to that. Are you guys with me this morning? Why don't we be people who control those devices and we catch it? Let's be mature. That's, we don't just need the cerebral, you know, frontal lobe here. We got the mind of Christ, amen? Philippians 2 says that you have the mind of Christ, and you don't have to give into that stuff. You can change that. If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is check your phone, <laughs> researchers would say you're probably getting close to a phone addiction. This stuff makes us feel better, but it takes us away from God. Our comfort should come from Him. Our relationship should come from Him. All those things that, that to remind us and the attention that we need. There's a God whose eyes are on you right now. Yeah. He's thinking about you right now. And how sad is it that we would run to something else, no matter who or what it is, and get this terrible second place validation for our life when there's a God who loves you so much he'd pay the ultimate price just so you would know it. Yeah. Man, God's in love with you. He adores you. Can we be people who rise up in a maturity and a faith and say, I'm not going to do that the way that I used to do that anymore. You're going to see depression and anxiety, more of this in your life, statistically speaking, as a result, as a result of you running to those things other than God. But if you run to him, if you run to the healthy relationships in your life that people have, that God's given you, you're going to find a different level of community, the body of Christ. You're going to find a different level of security. You'll, you'll, those insecure tendencies will go away. New neurons will form synapses in your brain that will create new roads that continue to remind you and build up health. Are you guys learning anything this morning? I love John chapter 8. I'll close with this. Jesus and the woman uh, who was caught in the act of adultery. I'm sure you guys know this story. It's one of the most beautiful stories in the gospel. It's one of my favorite stories about Jesus because I think we can all relate. It says chapter 8 verse 2. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Now listen to this. The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they set, had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Adultery means that either she was married or the person that she was having this relationship was married. And so outside of that, this, this behavior outside of that, and in that culture... And that society was not only an incredible um, level of shame that would have translated, transcended from generation to generation, but it was also punishable by death. The thing was, it was only punishable by death in the Old Testament times, hundreds of years before this, because there was a new governance in which the Caesars and the, the governor, they would have to proclaim uh, or announce or condone the execution of people. So it's kind of weird because it's like the Old Testament law was saying you're supposed to take care of this, but they couldn't really act out the Old Testament law. And so they come to Jesus and they set a trap, knowing this. And they said to him, this woman was caught in the, the act of adultery. By the way, she was caught in the act of adultery. Where's the dude? Where's the dude at? Obviously there was a guy who was caught too, but they don't want to put him in the middle of this whole thing. I'm just gonna leave that there. Okay, another sermon for another time. This guy gets off the hook, but she doesn't. Now Moses commanded that you should be stoned. They are trying to trap Jesus. What do you say? And they said, testing him. They thought that he might have something to which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. And I just think this is so funny that every commentator that I'm reading, every, his, you know, Every scholar is saying, like, what's Jesus writing on the ground? Is he writing out the sins of the people who are standing there? Is he writing out the, 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 you know, the commandment in Exodus 20 that thou shalt not commit? What, what, is he, what is he writing down? But it says here, he's writing it as if he doesn't hear them. Jesus is, like, about to teach. They shove this woman into this mush pot. Mush pot. Remember you do Duck, Duck, Goose back in the day? Duck, Duck, Goose. And the person who didn't went run fast enough, they were in the middle. Mush, mush, right? It's terrible. Shame, shame. She's in the, the shame pot in the middle. Dude's not there. She's by herself, caught in the act of adultery. Jesus, what are you going to do? 
Are, are we going to stone her the way the Bible says? Or are you going to live out this grace that you've been living out in front of everybody else? And Jesus doesn't answer. Just bends over and just writes on the ground. And they keep asking him. It says he persists. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. And he stooped down and wrote on the ground again. Jesus isn't going to play this game. He's not going to give into this trap. This isn't a trap for him. He bends down. He writes on the ground. I don't know what he's doing, playing tic-tac-toe with himself. It doesn't matter. Because what he's doing is he's creating an awkward moment. Because I don't know if you've met Jesus. He loves awkward moments. He loves awkward moments. He's giving them the moment to analyze what's happening here and really figure out, are they going to give in to what's happening here? Um, is this going to be a fear thing? Is this going to be a wait, What's really happening here? The Lord gives you awkward moments. He gives you the amygdala. He gives you the, these different moments to just capture it. Ca capture the, 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 why am I thinking this way? Why am I feeling this way? Now that I realize this is not a truth, what am I going to do with it? I'm going to present it to God. I'm going to see what he has to say. And as everyone was standing there, you're watching this moment as God just stalls it out, makes it a longer moment. Are you really going to pick up rocks and bury this woman with rocks alive? Because you really think that's what we should do here. This woman standing there by herself, scared for her life. Those who heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and said, no one but the woman, he said to her. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And he spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He says, I am the light of the world. And shame will try to keep you in the dark. Shame will try to keep you living under the expectations of others. Shame will make you pick up your phone and text 10, text 10 people. Hi, how you doing? What's up? Hi. So that when you feel bad about yourself, bing, 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 your phone goes off and you feel a little bit of that dopamine release. You feel a little bit better about yourself. Man, that is a, a poor second, distant second place to knowing how much God loves you and taking the opportunity to demolish the lie and to receive more of the grace that you know is available for you. Shame will try to keep you in the dark, but let me tell you something. What lives in the dark, Jesus says, dies in the light. He says, I am the light of the world. Stop living in darkness. Stop running into hiding. Stop trying to cover yourself with everything else that makes you feel better. Say, I know you gotta run somewhere, but don't run to the expectations of others and don't run to that hiding place. He says, come to me. In Genesis chapter three, verse 20, before God sends Adam and Eve out of the garden, he says, before you go, those fig leaves that you sewed together and you made a covering for yourself, I got something for you. And he sacrifices an animal. Did you know this? And he takes the animal, the first sacrifice ever in the history of the world was because he took the skin of the animal and he made clothes to cover Adam and Eve. Because he knows that sin makes you feel exposed and it makes you wanna run. But he wants you to be covered by him and he wants you to run to him. He wants you to know that that feeling of running, that that might be a feeling that's very well put there in your brain and the science of your mind that knows that you need to respond. But how are you going to respond? Are you going to respond to him? Are you going to let Jesus cover you? Are you going to let his sacrifice be enough? Or are you going to try to come up with a better plan? Will you stand to your feet all over the building? I'm going to tell you, God loves you. He's got a great purpose for your life. And he understands that what you've done, it makes you feel distant from him. But he's never left you. Your feeling that you're getting of God leaving you, that's not true. You might have stepped away from him, but he's pursuing you right now. He's obsessed with you. His attention is on you. He never stops thinking about you. And today you've got to say, I'm going to stop believing this lie that God left me. And I'm going to turn and I'm going to run to him. I'm going to stop covering myself with all this other stuff that makes me feel better about myself. And I'm going to go to the one thing that I know I can count on, which is the presence and the grace of God. If that's you, you need to stop believing a lie today. 
You need to stop believing a lie today. You need to say, I'm not going to believe anymore that I'm worthless. I'm not going to believe anymore that I'm not worth it. I'm not going to believe anymore that I'm not good enough. I'm not going to believe anymore that I'm always going to struggle. But I'm going to believe today that I am who he says that I am. He is who he says that he is. And together I can be covered. I can be secure. I can be forgiven. I can be filled with God. If that's you, you need to stop believing those lies anymore. Come on, in a moment of of courage right now, shoot your hand up if that's you, if today you're going to stop believing those lies. Come on, shoot your hand up. Shoot your hand up. Let's go back into this song. Let's worship together. Let's declare that chains are going to break in this moment, that fear is going to bow in this moment. Come on, let's worship the God of truth. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Come on, let's worship Him together.